There we go. So um, I am thrilled to introduce Rabbi Diane Elliott, who's my teacher and my good friend and companion of the heart and the spirit. Rabbi Diane Elliott is a spiritual teacher, ritual leader, somatic therapist, and writer, I will add, and dancer. Um, based in the San Francisco Bay Area, she inspires her students to become clearer channels for, for presence through awareness and movement practices, chant, and nuanced interpretations of sacred text. Rabbi Diane serves as a program, program director in the Aleph Alliance for Jewish Renewal, and uh, along with me as a steward and faculty member and founder of Taproot, a multi-generational community of Jewish artists, activists, and change makers. Among her publications is This is the Day, Hayom Yom, poems inspired by the practice of counting the Omer. To learn more about Rabbi Diane, Rabbi Diane and her work, visit holypresent.com. can't remember if it's .com, .org. She'll tell us. Uh, Rabbi Diane, what an honor to have you back here in our Tikkun Lael Shavuot. We're so grateful that you have made um, this uh, particular event your Shavuot home. Rabbi Diane. Thank you, Rabbi Irwin. It's so good to be here with everyone on this um, Lael Shavuot. So Hag Sameach, everyone. Hag Sameach. Come in. Um, standing here together at the foot of the mountain. And I have the sense from what's already transpired this evening that a number of, of your presenters are kind of on the same page, uh, looking at um, different ways of approaching revelation, prophecy. Um, myself, in addition to um, being, as Reb Irwin said, a dancer and spiritual teacher and I, I am a lifelong lover and maker of poems. And so as we were approaching Shavuot this year, and uh, Rabbi Irwin said, would you like to offer something at the Tikkun? I, um, and that the, the subject was, the topic, the theme is revelation, prophecy, how we are open to that, how we receive at this, at this crucial, juncture of our ritual year, open to that receiving. And I felt into the revelatory moments as they are chronicled in our tradition, in the Torah, in the books of the prophets, the Nevi'im, in the Kit Kituvim, in the writings, and much more of our canon as it comes down to us. And I was struck by how, how much our Jewish textual traditions, that is the words of the prophets and the dreamers of times past that have come down to us are in fact poetry. That the Hebrew language itself, that many of those texts have come to us in is a very poetic language. Um, the sound and the rhythm and the, and the the texture of the language is poetic. And so I want to begin our journey, what I hope will be just a journey together, not so much um, a, um, an, an exercise in mental understanding, but more of an embodied experience of um, this journey. With, with a few guiding questions, and I'm gonna share my screen. I can do that here. So just uh, inviting you to settle in in kind of a more of a rest and digest state to the next 40 minutes or so. And um, you may wanna have a uh, something to journal or write with close by, you may not, that may not be your way in. Or you may wanna have something to draw with, or you may just wanna settle into a comfortable place in your room, in your chair, 
sitting, lying down, you may want to move with these questions. How is poetry a kind of prophetic revelation? How does poetry express prophetic vision? And how do poetic inspiration and prophetic inspiration draw from the same sources? Poetry, like prophecy, is not simply an artifact, not simply something on a page, or even something that we might hear spoken, but it's a state of encounter, I would offer. It's a, a, a way of perceiving the world that exposes heretofore hidden information, makes surprising connections, makes the invisible visible, and the visible newly visible, the unheard audible, and the audible heard in a different way. Poetry, like prophecy, is perception channeled through the sensibility of an individual mind and heart. It engages the imagination, heightens the senses, and surprises the mind with unexpected connections, metaphor, simile, onomatopoeia, oxymoron, which are not simply figures of speech, but actually mind-altering juxtapositions that convey gut-churning, hairpin curves in the poet's perception and are aimed at jolting the receiver out of tunnel-visioned states and exposing new worlds. So in her marvelous book, Saved by a Poem, maybe some of you know it, Kim Rosen writes this. Poems return us to the power of words to tell the truth. They develop our capacity to speak the complexities of our lives in all the wonder and horror, grace, mystery, and ambiguity. In his eulogy for Robert Frost, John F. Kennedy said, when power leads us toward arrogance, poetry reminds us of our limitations. When power narrows the areas of our concern, poetry reminds us of the richness and diversity of our existence. When power corrupts, poetry cleanses. Unquote. I hope that as I'm sharing with you that you'll begin to make your own inner connections uh, with what you know of our prophetic tradition and what you know of poetry. Uh, I'm not going to make those necessarily in an explicit way, but I'm going to offer space for us to feel the cross-pollination and to feel how that works in our own lives and our own sensibilities. Poetry, like prophecy, speaks the language of the soul to the soul. Through it, we witness the world, our lives, others' presences, from wildly tilted angles sometimes, revealing new layers of meaning, the process of channeling a poem, like dreams and prophecy, 
may reveal to the channeler wisdom and understanding they didn't know they possessed, cracking the surface of reality to reveal the eternal peaking or pouring through. In the words of the great poet prophet, Leonard Cohen, if I can bring these up, they don't want to come up. There we go. Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. So just coming back together here for a moment. Were you able to see the screen okay? Good, okay. So this evening, as has been already told and will be retold, we stand with the generations of B'nai Yisrael, seekers and wrestlers and reachers, yearning to open ourselves as prophets and mystics have through the ages to become like them, poets of the soul, at least of our own souls. And so in the next half hour or so, I'd like to invite us on a little poetic journey through what I see as three phases of the prophetic calling. And as we move through each of these phases, um, we'll be hearing um, a piece of ancient prophetic text juxtaposed side by side with a contemporary poem. And there were many that I could have chosen from, and I, I chose a few that I think speak both to this moment and re represent um, a variety of points of view and generations. Hi, I'm listening to Diane Elliott. You want to join me? Thank you. So please mute yourself if you're not muted. And um, my hope is that these juxtapositions will set the stage for a few minutes of meditation, perhaps of journaling, for your own meditation, your own channeling. And I'll offer a little bit of um, background sound for those moments of meditation. And for each of these stages, um, looking at prophecy as poetry, poetry as prophecy, and opening a brief space, the three phases that will move through the call, the prophetic call, the vision, and the charge. an opportunity for each of us to situate ourselves this evening in this process of revelation, to seat ourselves a little bit more deeply than we have as we enter bit by bit, hour by hour into this tikkun, this repair, this time of repair, not as an observer or a passive receiver of information, but as an active participant at the center stage of revelation, a prophet and poet that each one of us is. So I'm going to suggest that we do a little bit of embodied attunement first of our set sense of hearing as we, we move toward the call. So if you want to just, if you're comfortable with just warming your hands up, up a little bit, just rubbing your hands together a little bit, generating a little bit of heat and waking up your fingers, your arms, and your hands. They're going to help our ears. And then just to bring your hands up and massage your outer ear, just to, uh, we used to have the animal ca capacity more to, to turn our ears in different directions and pick up sounds. We've kind of atrophied that, that skill, but we can wake up those outer ears a little bit and then just pat your ears. That's it, a good yawn always helps too. <laughs> and then if you wanna squeeze your ears together using your thumb and your middle finger, uh, your 
thumb and your first finger, and then with your middle finger, just tap the area right above your ear. So we're just kind of sensitizing our ears a little bit. That's it. Good. Good. So I'm going to share my screen again, and I hope that the share screen goes a little bit more smoothly on my end this time. Okay. So let's move to the next slide, if we can. The call. So the first selection is the call. Almost every major prophet from Moses through the rest of the Tanakh receives some kind of a call, a calling. This is the call of the prophet Jeremiah. And it begins, I'm going to read it mostly in English, but by Yehi Devar Havaya Elai Lemor, here was the word of yud heh vav -Heh that came to me saying, before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. And before you left the womb, I sanctified you, made you a prophet to the nations. But I said, alas, my master, Adonai Elohim, I don't know how to speak, for I'm only a boy. Then Yah said to me, don't say I'm only a boy. For wherever I send you, you will go, and all that I command you, you will speak. Don't fear them, for I am with you to rescue you, the word of yod heh -he. Then the divine stretched out their hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Look, I have placed my words in your mouth. See, I have appointed you this day over nations and over the kingdoms to uproot and to smash, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Lean tosh, lean totes. Ulaha avid, ulaha aros. Leave note, lean toa. So just taking that in, feeling that in your body. Our, our texts are nothing if they're not filled with body sense and body imagery. And when we really hear them, not just with the ears, but with our whole body, it begins to take us to that place where they must have been to receive that call, to receive that shattering call. So the poem I've chosen to place side by side is Pablo Neruda's poetry translated from the Spanish by Alastair Reed. And I, I invite you to, if you want to close your eyes and just receive this with your ears, it's here for you to see also if that helps you. I'm going to read it. Poetry. It was at that age, poetry arrived in search of me. I don't know, I don't know where it came from, from winter or a river. I don't know how or when, no, they were not voices, they were not words nor silence, but, but from a street I was summoned, from the branches of night, abruptly from others, among violent fires, or returning alone. There I was without a face, and it touched me. I did not know what to say. My mouth had no way with names. My eyes were blind, and something started in my soul, fever or forgotten wings, and I made my own way, deciphering that fire, and I wrote the first faint line, faint, without substance, pure nonsense, pure wisdom of someone who knows nothing. 
And suddenly I saw the heavens unfastened and open. Planets, palpitating plantations, shadow perforated, riddled with arrows, fire and flowers, the winding night, the universe, and I, infinitesimal being, infinites infinitesimal being, drunk with the great starry void, likeness, image of mystery, for myself, a pure part of the abyss, I wheeled with the stars, and my heart broke loose on the wind. I'm going to ask you now to take a moment in, in quiet meditation, contemplation, perhaps with a pen and paper, perhaps simply sitting with this question, to what are you being called? And we'll have about three minutes to sit with it. Just that perhaps you might, if you want to be witnessed in what's coming through for you, to place a word, an image, a bit of writing in the chat. We could really spend plenty of time on this sense of being called and how that call comes to you. But really bringing ourselves ourselves present to this moment, this night, this Tikkun Leil Shavuot, this moment in your life. Is there a call? Can you hear it? What form does it take?
So we're moving into the vision now and oftentimes a poem comes through, most oftentimes comes through an individual and many of the prophets, prophets in our tradition are individuals. What was so amazing and unusual and mind-blowing about this night of revelation in our tradition at Mount Sinai was at least for a short while, somehow it was the entire people that received the vision, that had a vision of what was coming, of what was needed. And so here's a section just after the giving of the Aseret HaDibro, the Ten Commandments, in Exodus, in the book of Exodus. And it says, the entire people, the kol ha'am ro'im et hakolot, the entire people saw the voices and the flames, the sound of the shofar and the smoking mountain, and the people were afraid and trembled and backed away. They said to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear. Let God not speak with us lest we die. But Moses said to the people, don't be afraid, for God has come in order to lift you up, in order that awe of the one shall be upon your innermost selves, this vision, this seeing that's happening, so that you shall not sin, so that you shall not fall out of balance, so that you shall not fall back into Mitzrayim. The people stood far off as Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. And yud heh -Vav -Heh said to Moses, Thus shall you say to the children of Israel, You have seen that I have spoken with you from the heavens. Let's take a moment to wake up our vision before we hear the poem. So if you just want to circle your fingers around your eyes, a little bit, your eye sockets, and release the habitual ways of seeing, the patterns that we already project out into the world before we can actually see what's there. You might wanna just pinch your brows gently, and there are delicate, soft muscles around the eyes, and they get so tired looking out at the world, looking at screens, reading all day. That's it. And then just carry that release into your whole face a little bit to release the mask of our faces. So we hold our faces in a way also of habitually being seen, which can prejudice the way we see, how we feel we are seeing. So your cheeks, your forehead, just releasing the visual sense and the sense of being seen. Gently patting the face is another great way to release. And then if you just want to gently brush your, your hair or your energy back across the top of your head and trace the pathway of your vagus nerve that comes down the back to your throat, to your heart, and then down into your belly. So this is the nerve that regulates us through visually seeing other people's faces and hopefully seeing faces of empathy and compassion. So that's a beautiful way to just wake up the pathway of our seeing. I'm going to share the screen again, and we're going to read an excerpt of a poem by Amanda Gorman. Amanda Gorman, you may remember, was the young woman whose poem, who read her poem at the inauguration of President Biden. And her first book came out not too long ago. And it's an amazing book, a prophetic book, I would say. And she has in it many visions of our country, of this land and 
of how life is in it for many of the people in it. So again, you may wanna um, either rest your eyes during this reading or um, look around your space and see what your eyes are attracted to, what you see as I read this for us. This is um, an excerpt of The Truth in One Nation from Fury and Faith by Amanda Gorman. The world still terrifies us. We're told to write what we know. We write what we're afraid of. Only then is our fear made small by what we love. Every second what we feel for our people and our planet almost brings us to our knees, a compassion that nearly destroys us with its massiveness. There is no love for or in this world that doesn't feel both bright and unbearable, uncarryable. We built this place knowing it could lead, knowing it might not last, knowing it might lose. Our people, we take thee to have and to scold, to love and to change in sickness and in health, till breath do us part. How do we pronounce you land and strife? Our hands must not lay down what they begun. Young our country seems and stumbling, but striking like a lion learning its legs, one nation blunder pawed. What we have not done delicately, at least let us do decently and deliberately, for there is still a promise here. We have promised here of all. Some days we believe in nothing but belief, but it is enough to carry us forward. We believe we can transform without war or wariness. We are stubborn, not simple, strategic like a general who sees they may not win this battle. We're optimistic, not because we have hope, but because only by being optimistic can hope be ours to have. Grief depends on love. What we cherish most shall leave, but what we've changed can last, chartered and chosen. We imagine us and all we'll make of one another, our faces wet and shimmering like an open wound, dazed by the flare of our new made selves. The truth is one world, wonder awed, raw, with revelation. What do you see, hear, feel, touch, taste? Perhaps seeing isn't your way isn't your way of looking, of counter, encountering the world. Take another few moments to breathe, to meditate, to see what comes, to journal, or simply to open the space.
So once again, perhaps if a nugget came to you, something that you can place into the chat or maybe one of the imagery, images that came to you from the poetry or from the, the text from Torah. So we'll move into the final um, phase, the final section of that we're gonna look at tonight, which is the charge. Oftentimes, when the revelation comes through, there's a sense of needing to bring some message out into the world. So um, here we go, last, last screen share here. So from scripture, I've brought us um, a selection from the prophet Isaiah, which forms part of our Haftarah on Yom Kippur. And this is a really powerful section that you may recognize begins with uh, the words, is this, is this the fast that I require of you? Um, rather, no, this is not the fast of simply doing some kind of ritual activity, but this is the charge that you are to, to uh, this is what you are to bring forth in the world. So just reading these words from Isaiah, letting them wash over us. Should you not share your bread with the hungry and bring the unhoused into your home? When you see the naked, clothe them and not hide yourself from your kin. Then your light would burst through like the dawn and your healing sprout quickly and your righteousness would precede you and the glory of God would gather you in. Then when you call, yud heh vav -Hey would answer. And when you cry out, God will say, Hineni, here I am. When you banish the yoke from your midst, the pointing finger and slanderous speech, when you offer your soul to the hungry and satisfy the famished ones, then your light will shine in the darkness and your gloom will become bright as noon. Then yud heh vav -Hey will guide you continually. Refresh your soul in parched places. Strengthen your bones. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Some among you will rebuild ancient wastelands foundations for the generations will be raised up and you will be known as the ones who break down old walls blaze blaze trails to new ways of living and the poem that i wanted to share with you the contemporary poem which i hear as a charge is Aurora Levin's Morales's Vea Havta. Maybe you're familiar with this amazing version of the Vea Havta. And um, this will be our last poem and our uh, opening just to a couple of moments of meditation for ourselves as we bring this little journey to, toward a close. Vea Havta. Say these words when you lie down and when you rise up, when you go out and when you return, in times of mourning and in times of joy. Inscribe them on your doorposts, embroider them on your garments, tattoo them on your shoulders, teach them to your children, your neighbors, your enemies, recite them in your sleep. Here in the cruel shadow of empire, another world is possible. Thus spoke the prophet Roke Dalton, all together they have more death than we, but all together we have more life than they. There is more bloody death in their hands than we could ever wield unless we lay down our souls to become them and then we will lose everything. So instead, imagine winning. This is your sacred task. This is your power. Imagine every detail of winning, the exact smell of the summer streets in which no one has been shot. 
the muscles you have never unclenched from worry, gone soft as newborn skin, the sparkling taste of food when we know that no one on earth is hungry, that beggars are fed, that the old man under the bridge and the woman wrapping herself in thin sheets in the back seat of a car and the children who suck on stones nest under a flock of roofs that keep multiplying their shelter. Lean with all your being towards that day when the poor of the world shake down a rain of good fortune out of the heavy clouds and justice rolls down like waters. Defend the world in which we win as if it were your child. It is your child. Defend it as if it were your lover. It is your lover. When you inhale and when you exhale, breathe the possibility of another world into the 37.2 trillion cells of your body until it shines with hope. Then imagine more. Imagine rape is unimaginable. Imagine war is scarcely credible rumor that the crimes of our age, the grotesque inhumanities of greed, the sheer and astounding shamelessness of it, the vast fortunes made by stealing lives, the horrible normalcy it came to have is unimaginable to our heirs, the generations of the free. Don't waver. Don't let despair sink its sharp teeth into the throat with which you sing. Escalate your dreams. Make them burn so fiercely that you can follow them down any dark alleyway of history and not lose your way. Make them burn clear as a starry drinking gourd over the grim fog of exhaustion and keep walking. Hold hands, share water, keep imagining so that we, the children of our children's children, can live. I'm holding this question just together for another moment or two. What is this moment's charge? So these are not questions that we're going to answer in two or three minutes or um, prophetic visions, although perhaps by the end of the evening, you will have some visions, some words that come to you. And just um, seeing what's in the chat here. Um, I'm going to save the chat so that I can look at it later. And maybe you want to do the same at the bottom of the chat. If you open it up, there are three little dots and anybody can click on those dots and save the chat and maybe witnessing each other living in hope. I can make these slides available. Yes. And uh, uh, the imagery and the poems are amazing. And so is our tradition. And I think you could 
perhaps tell the juxtaposition. So I want to thank you for going on this journey with me and um, blessing you with a, a deepening um, dive into the rest of this, this evening of Shavuot and tomorrow as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Rabbi Diane, thank you so much for this is stunning, stunning, beautiful, masterful. Thank you so much for giving us all of this richness. When folks are ready, just take your time. You can leave the room and go back to the main room and you'll get your choice of two new Zoom rooms. The next sessions are, did a volcanic eruption cause the exodus? Was it divine intervention with David Sussman? Or locating Dot, getting in touch with your true self with Kohenet Ruach Dvorah Gren and rabbinic pastor Judith Goldman. So we'll see you back in the main room. Thank you, Rabbi Diane. It's a beautiful teaching. Thank you so much, everyone. It was great to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yeah, so cool. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank, was just you beautiful. Thank you, Diane. It was beautiful. Wonderful. Thank you, Rabbi Diane. Thank you. So cool.